Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the EvoSec podcast. I am joined by my subordinate and second in command, twin brother, Aaron Davis. Man, Aaron, you, you got your Christmas shopping done? No, I don't, but let's just address that first thing you said. <laughs> I'm about to stage an inter- in. I'm going to stage an insurrection, but with no weapons. Like this, how's that, uh, that going to go for me? Yeah, that's uh, you know, we'll see how January six insurrection plays out, I guess. But <laughs> well, kind of similar. I'll kind of like how they did. I'll do something like, you know, run up and punch you, and then run off. It's my tactic. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, kidding aside, man, what's up? Good to be here with you, brother. Awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by a special guest. For a third time, the man, the myth, Mr. Chuck Haggard of Agile Training and Consulting. Chuck, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks for asking me on. It's it's a pleasure, and you know, just for the audience out there, we've had some we've had some shitty uh, internet and and technical issues, so we're we're kicking this off again. Well, Chuck, for our audience members out there, we're gonna point them to your previous shows, but just give us a summarized bio for audience members that don't know you. Okay. I've got a little bit of a military background, mainly a police background. Uh, I've been 35 years of law enforcement is uh, where I'm currently at and, uh, and counting. Retired out of one job after 28 years and I'm bad at retirement. So, uh, Took another job, worked there for six and a half, where I was a police officer, firefighter, uh, air crash rescue specialist. Um, After I retired from the first job, opened up my training company, Agile Training and Consulting, do uh, firearms tactics, uh, reasonable use of force, expert witness work, security consulting, things like site security, uh, uh, that sort of thing, uh, consulting on people do uh do quite a bit of training I, I started that because most of my life i was involved in either a military or police training paradigm uh, some sort of agency thing i uh, am still a national trainer for national law enforcement training center out of kansas city which uh, specializes in in law enforcement police use of force stuff uh, and what we do is that's all instructor level training so we certify instructors so that they can go back to their departments and uh, teach in an academy or in-service setting, that sort of thing. Uh, But when I got close to my uh, first retirement, um, I got asked to, uh, after I was teaching in the the Range Master Tactical Conferences, after uh, Tom Gibbons invited me to, to teach at those, I got asked by people outside of law enforcement to do training. So I started, started my company so that I would, you know, have a means to do that. Uh, and that's, I've been staying pretty busy, uh, lately more busy outside the cop world than in it. And, and how do you like that? You like that, uh, more on the outside of the law enforcement right now. I mean, just a different season in your life. I don't know what's your thoughts on that. You like it better right now or. So I just did a, I was just down in the Nashville area in Murfreesboro. Uh, I got hosted by my friends, uh, Ock and Tiffany at, uh, um, nice, uh, CSA. And then we were at, uh, um, outpost armory down there in Murfreesboro. And, uh, so everybody that was there, you know, the, I did an OC instructor school, some street encounter tactics, and I did a uh, combative pistol course. And everybody in all the classes was enthusiastic to be there, eager to learn, uh, wanted, you know, they're there uh, because they wanted to be. So uh, contrast that with my previous life. Maybe I'm in an academy setting and I have people, let's say we're doing firearms training. I have people that probably, you know, a lot of them don't even want to be there. They're not gun people. They don't see where it's important. Or even worse, you got jaded cops that have been on the job for a long time and they, uh, that they don't, they don't think they need any of that because they don't know what they don't know. One of the most soul sucking things you can deal with is like having to do an in-service class for day shift detectives on a large agency. And, um, 
you, you have people that want to bitch about getting paid to shoot free ammo on a warm no screen day. I don't get it. Things like that. So um, in, in a law enforcement setting, in an agency setting, I had to force the training. You know, you offer good training. People still don't want to participate in it. Uh, so you have to make them minimum go through the, you know, do what, do what they need to do to know what they need to know so that you can put them out on the street and they don't make buffoons of themselves in the agency. Uh, whereas in, in the non-cop world, uh, it, it isn't that way. Every once in a while you get that guy, but for the most part, uh, people are very, you know, they, they made an investment. They made an investment in themselves, uh, money, ammo, time, time off work, uh, travel, maybe away from family, things like that. So they take it pretty seriously and they're pretty enthusiastic about that. So uh, I find it very rewarding to be doing the non-cop stuff. Well, and you know, our good friend Craig Douglas has talked about that many times about when he was a trainer in his departments about how special it was to him to, him to be around people that just wanted to be there for the training. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Well, and I think that's a good time to bring up a class I took from you, Chuck. You, Cecil Birch, and Daryl Bokey, um, the non-permissive environment or MPE counter-robbery class. Yeah, I, I, I had to try and figure out when that was. I looked at my calendar. I couldn't find it, honestly. But it was a couple months ago. And I'll tell you, it was full of full of um of students that really wanted to be there Mm -hmm. it it was an excellent class it was material that people really need to be exposed to it's it's one of those types of classes that maybe doesn't draw the people that just want to shoot a bunch of rounds and and you know work on metrics and stuff and and you know work on a sub second draw etc but it was just a highly valuable class. And, you know, essentially I'll just go into it real quick at a high level. We, um, of course had Cecil Birch who worked with us on what's known as man- managing unknown contacts and verbalization. That's of course, when dealing with people on the street, either benign or dangerous person, figuring that out and dealing with those people. And then, and Daryl Bokey worked with us on, on some of the firearm stuff. And, and what was fun about that is that since this was an MPE class, we actually, like for me, I ran my little Glock 42 and for one thing had a blast running it. And it, in though, just an aside, it, it didn't feel like I was running a little pistol with that thing. So those are a shockingly capable small gun. Uh, I use I use the Glock 42 in my small guns class for demos, uh, and quite frankly, it's almost like cheating. It you know it recoils like a 22, uh, has good has good wound ballistics. It's as accurate as any of the other Glocks. Um, if you look at the uh, like the uh, down zero zone on an IDPA target, I can keep all my rounds inside of down zero out past 40 yards with that Glock 42. Nice. Um, oh wow. It's just, it's, it's a surprisingly capable small gun. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I've, I've got one and, and my wife carries one, but, um, yeah, I I love that little pistol now. And then of course you came in and gave us some, some coursework on OC spray. Now you're, you're quite well known for that. And, um, Again, one of these days I need to take a, an actual class from you on that. But but what I really want to talk about is that, of course, that the three of you had your slices of the class. But then you guys also had a the classroom sections were a lot of fun because we weren't just with one of you guys working on your three slices. We had all three of you guys in the same room and all both excuse me, all you guys bouncing things off each other and, and just wisdom bombs one after the other. So I, I just kind of want to circle it back to, I'm sure a lot of our audience knows this, but 
what is NPE? What does that stand for? And and if you could explain what that really means to our audience. So a lot of people will think non-permissive environment, someplace where what we're not advocating is something like, you know, trying to sneak a gun onto a plane. But uh, let's say Cecil in his former life, when he was in the corporate world, it would be legal for him to run around with a gun, but that might be off-putting to clients. And when you have, you know, six and seven figure deals that you're dealing with, uh, the last thing you want to do is, uh, you know, print or have somebody figure out you're armed, be offended by that. You lose, you know, a six figure deal, let's say that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have friends that have uh, been in academia, which, you know, can be fairly, le- we'll call it left leaning for one of a better, it's not, not terminology I really agree with, but everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say it. So, uh, like I, I have a couple of friends that have been, uh, that are, uh, or have been university professors and even though they could legally carry a gun on campus, if the job found out they were up to it, you know, being, being bla- basically blackballed, uh, having negative, uh, you know, consequences that, you know, some, some of the careers you get into, people think, oh, well, you just get another job. Well, if, if you get kind of blacklisted or blackballed in, in some career fields, you may be done in that career field for the rest of your life. Um, so we've seen that happen in, in, a, in a larger, more public venue of, uh, say, Hollywood stars. You have somebody that comes out for whatever political and then they get blacklisted and you don't see them in the movies anymore, that sort of thing. Yep. Well, that sort of thing happens in, in a number of other uh employment fields as well. So even though you can legally do something, maybe you don't want to spook people. Maybe you don't want to lose a deal. Maybe you don't want to, uh, you know, have negative employment consequences. So that would still be a a non-permissive environment. Or maybe you have in a a venue that you want to go to and the rules of, let's say it's uh, an arena, and the rules of the arena are just their rules. Like if they if they catch you rolling dirty with a gun, you're going to be told you have to leave. So you know now you're out. Concert tickets or sports tickets or whatever. But you know that con that most security is security theater. So you don't want to leave your uh, self defense or you know your safety in the hands of lowest common com- denominator. Uh, security theater people, right? So maybe you're going to go ahead and and risk getting booted out of the venue. So what do you want? How do you want to do that? Um, You know, none of us are advocating rolling dirty in the manner of you're going to break the law. You're going to go to prison, except not advocating that. But uh, there's a difference between, I think, trying to sneak a gun onto an airplane and then rolling truly concealed, truly low profile. So when you go into a $1.2 million deal, uh, with, uh, with clients, you don't blow the whole thing. Right. So does that make sense? Oh, certainly. Um, well, then the, the other thing we talk about is the difference between truly concealed carry and covered carry mm -hmm. a whole lot of people in the concealed carry world are covered they're covering their guns. So instead of a gun in a flap holster, it's a gun under a t-shirt, but in, in either way, it's not really concealed, right? It's just covered, covered carry Mm -hmm. where, whereas we talk about uh, some of the tactical advantages of if you need a gun and having that gun be truly a surprise to your bad guy. Um, And, and, you know, some of those sorts of things. So, uh, when we're talking about MPE counter robbery, and then we also talk about things like uh, you know all all three of us, uh, particularly uh, Daryl and I, have uh, had some bad luck with airlines. Maybe you get stuck like here this year. I got stuck 18 hours in the Atlanta airport, um, and then they lost my bag with my guns in it. So now I'm in Georgia, and all I have with me is a flashlight. 
very, very bright flashlight because you can carry that on, uh, you can carry that on the airplane. So uh, I had to immediately, what I, what I had done, because I had a little bit of time, I had to do some traveling to get where I was going in a rental car, sourced some OC, uh, sourced uh, a, uh, a knife, and then, you know, maybe I can't, maybe I go someplace I have a gun, like I've traveled, you know, out of, out of uh, country. I've been to places like Belize or, uh, you know, other countries where you can't really have a gun or source a gun unless you're going to be, you know, like a cartel guy or whatever. Um, so we talk about ways that you can have uh, defensive implements with you, whatever those may be, uh, within the confines of the environment that you find yourself in. Maybe it's an impact weapon, maybe it's a OC or some other defensive spray, maybe it's an edge weapon, uh, whatever the case may be, then how do you source these things? How do you use these things? How do you hide these things? Um, and then, you know, do the best that you can in the environment you find yourself in. Well, one, a couple of things that spring to mind that, especially when it comes to sourcing weapons at, at whatever location you've found yourself in. Um, I want to digress real quick when it comes to the, and then I'll get right back to that. I did want to just say this. So back to your issue of, of concealed carry versus, you know, actually concealed carry. I, um, Daryl gave the three different levels concealed carry, excuse me, pardon me. Covered carry, concealed carry, and undetectable. And, and I found that nice to be able to kind of delineate those three types of carry. I, I'll be honest, a lot of the time I'm just covered carry because it's just it's just fine it's, where I where I live and, and work and everything. I'm not as concerned. I mean, not at work, but w- the things that I do, I, I'm just fine. Um, but I did want to say this, Chuck. When we went outside to do some of the OC stuff, you just had a T-shirt on, and then you download your Glock 19. And, and I thought, I did not notice that Chuck was carrying a Glock 19 under just that T-shirt. <laughs> so, you know, even someone that knows, it, it, again, that, that was some good cover carry right there. So, it can work, right? Mm-hmm. But, so... So back to the sourcing weapons on site, wherever you get there. One of the fun things that you brought up, and it reminded me of me being on cruises. You said that bring some duct tape with you, find a um, a, a piece of cardboard or a um, or a notebook or something like a legal pad cut up that legal we doing uh we're gonna do video or just audio on this one we're doing we're doing video but um are you wanting to show something so yeah as simple as yep you know here's take your your big chief tablet and what we're talking about is something as innocuous as that and uh you got some good duct tape and then um you can easily make a knife sheath with with those materials, and then go grab a steak knife out of the yep. out of the um, restaurant. Borrow a borrow a good steak knife out of the restaurant, which uh, I have. <laughs> so I've been a lot of places, done a lot of things, but I've never actually been on like one of those carnival cruises or something like that. Mm-hmm. But all of my friends that have been on those. Uh, tell me, oh yeah, you know, they got really, they're really sturdy steak knives. So um, they check you getting on the boat. They don't check you getting off the boat. Yeah. Nice. So in other words, you you could, are are you, cause see, I've been on a handful of cruises and I don't recall, it seems like they, you're saying when you get off, you could, you could maybe grab, one source knife and then when you get back on you know ditch that or or something so and then a, make another one so i got a friend that does uh uh we'll we'll call it national intelligence work 
And before you can take in a vacation, he has to like a family vacation, which he wants to, you know, most people want to have a good family life, things like that. They'll do his family has always done a cruise thing. So they'll do cruises. Well, he, he at his level has to, uh, send in his bosses have to look at his itinerary. So the cruise ship goes around and uh, maybe, maybe you have the different ports of call, right? So they'll tell him you can get off the boat here and here, but not there. So even when he's getting off the boat anywhere, it is a worry since he's outside of the country. So he doesn't have like his concealed carry that he would have uh, in CONUS. And he's not armed like he would have on assignment overseas. So, uh, you know, if you were going to like, you know, put a bag on his head and drag him into a van and put, uh, you know, flex cuffs on him and stuff, one of those places would be where you might want to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he think no, with his training experience, when he thinks about that, what he'll do is make himself, uh, you know, get a, get a nice steak knife from the, uh, from the cruise ship, make himself, uh, a duct tape and cardboard holster, he can carry the knife off of the ship, go through the metal detector to get back onto the ship after he has gifted the knife to somebody uh, before getting back on the boat. So, um, you know, th- it is a workable solution. I'm pretty sure the cruise ship companies aren't going to approve of that, um, but, you know, it, it it is what it is. Yep. You well, take I'll tell you, it's, it's, take care of your family. Yeah, it's certainly going to be on my repertoire um, when I go. Go, I th- I think I might go on a cruise. Maybe not next year, but I mean, of course, they're so damn expensive these days. But my my oldest, he is about. He's going to graduate next year. We're going to go on a pretty big vacation, so it might be another cruise. But and then. Like you gave an example <clears throat> of grabbing a a padlock, putting that in a sock for a sap too. Pad so a padlock and a bandana was uh, a street weapon very common with gangsters in the nineteen uh, eighties because a padlock and a bandana separately are totally legal. Can you walk around with a padlock in your pocket? Yeah. So if I loop the bandana through the loop of the, uh, the, the, the lock of the padlock, can I use that as a ersatz impact weapon, swing that thing? Yeah, it, it becomes what is legally known as a slung shot or, you know, a sap blackjack type of weapon. So that's another one. Um, if you look at the rules of where you're going, like when I went to Belize, I looked up, uh, you could have a folding knife three inches or less. So... I ended up with uh, one of the Spider Coast salts because I was going to, and I got the bright yellow handle because what is that? It's a dive knife, right? Uh, then when I got down there, I figured out that like every other dude in Belize was walking around with a machete. So a tip that I took from a buddy of mine that did a lot of overseas work is whenever he got into a country, uh, most cultures have some sort of knife that's you know, their thing, like if you go to the Philippines, it might be a bolo or, you know, you you guys get the idea, right? So whenever he went to a different country, there would be somebody that he could get a knife from that's like their national knife or something like that. So then he might be carrying his souvenir knife around with him until he uh, leaves to take it home. So that's his, that's his cover story. I've noticed when people are going to tropical places, I don't know that I don't have it here, but, uh, it around here someplace, uh, like my wife was going on a vacation with one of her friends to Costa Rica. And, uh, I did the tip of, she took a dive knife with her. So she had, it's a, a lime green, looks like a dive knife is a dive knife. Doesn't have that like, tactical death beard Spartan helmet look to it. Right. (laughs) And, uh, coming, coming through their customs, they didn't even look twice at it. They're like, Oh, you know, some, uh, some white chicks are going on vacation in a place where there's diving and they took some gear with them. They, they didn't even think twice of it. Awesome. This is all, all good tips. And it kind of reminds me of, uh, 
Greg Elifritz, his book, Choose Adventure, he goes through a lot of these examples and, and, and some very similar information. Um, but you're definitely, you got a excellent take on it, Chuck, and I'm sure our audience is definitely appreciating it. Well, and here's, here's the type of pencil that I was actually taking notes with in that class. It's a Stadler. It's a Japanese aluminum drafting pen, pencil, excuse me. And it, 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 you guys talked about, you know, normal pens, you know, not grabbing one of those big, you know, tactical looking pen. Every, almost anyone's going to know what that is, but I can put this on and I've got a notepad. I'm, I'm writing notes with my pencil, right? But this still, this could work in a, in a pinch too, because I mean, it's pretty sturdy, but that was another example you guys gave was, you know, non, I think, didn't you guys even bring up getting inexpensive, um, fountain pens? That was another thing that you suggested. Yeah, Cecil, uh, Cecil used to do a lot of when in his corporate life used to do a lot of like signing contracts and things like that. And he got into, uh, fountain pens because you know, it, it looks fancy. The writing, you know, your if you if you master that, your signature looks really nice. That sort of thing. So, and uh, fountain pens have nibs, and nibs are quite frankly rather sharp. Yes, yes, yeah. I I literally forgot about the fountain pen until <clears throat> I was talking about this. Um, let's see so, here. Uh, the other, the other huge part of that class, uh, the drills that uh, Daryl and I developed, um, and then you know the the muck that that Cecil and I teach, um, is what we want people to do is think of reasonable force options. You know, verbal commands, verbal de escalation, correct use of force at the correct time, and then if you have to, thinking with a gun in your hand. Uh, as as you recall in our in our live fire scenarios, not to yeah. let too much of the cat out of the bag, but you could screw that up, and then we'll, we'll uh, be telling you good luck at your murder trial. Um, yep. Because we use the their setup to like most range drills. Rule four is just kind of a gimme. You got a target, and there's a berm, and uh, you know rule four takes care of itself. But that's not reality. That's <clears throat> if you're getting jacked on a Walmart parking lot on a Friday afternoon, then what's the odds that you're going to have a completely uncluttered and safe rule for problem? You know, nobody downrange or nobody in between you and the bad guy or what have you. So in the real world, we want to make people think of how do you not endanger uh, the, the other people that are around you if they're around for your problem. So uh, as you, as you well recall, that was a huge part of some of the drills that we did was thinking with a gun in your hand as opposed to uh, just technical shooting. You, you, you want to have good technical shooting skills so that that becomes something that you can do with automaticity. Uh, that way you can use your brain to think about what you're doing and how you're doing it in the scenario as opposed to, oh man, I have to, you know, grip my pistol and then, you know, do this and do that to, to, to work the gun at a conscious level as opposed to a subconscious level. Um, and then part of what we do is, uh, as you may recall, give people options, uh, that phrase that I coined something between a harsh word and a gun, you know, we got mm -hmm. a little bit of empty hand skills. We got a little bit of uh, intermediate weapons with the OC. Um, and one of the things that, that I have found Daryl and I both agree with, cause we've both been there, is if you have a competent display of force or a competent use of force at a low level, you often don't have to use more force later to dig yourself out of a hole. Uh, you know, we, we, you can see in some of the police uh, action videos that we've seen where guys got themselves into a shooting that really maybe didn't need to happen. Um, mm -hmm. And then one of the one of the cases I talk about famously is uh, the <clears throat> George Zimmerman case. You know, if George Zimmerman had had the Muck class and then had intermediate, like let's say OC, 
if he had used verbal de-escalation and perhaps he had to deploy OC and sprayed Trayvon Martin instead of letting it devolve into a shooting, would we have ever heard of George Zimmerman or Trayvon Martin? Because the incident, we wouldn't have, because the incident wouldn't have uh, hit the news. So we want people to be thinking tacticians, have verbal agility, uh, have something between a harsh word and a gun. And then if it goes to guns, how to, how to utilize that effectively. That's all, all of that's part and parcel to that class. Well, and, and when it comes to the shooting, I, I did want to say this, me being a, a decent shooter, I actually, when I was shooting those, those drills, I went fairly dang slow. And, and the way I explained it to, I've explained it to people out so there and, and the um what what did he in the indoor ready position is really really cool but basically you would just kind of i felt like it was kind of like you were having to surgically insert yourself into a shot come back to um indoor ready surgically insert yourself into another shot or two and it it took a while to um make those decisions and see the angles you were shooting and I'll I'll tell you about I think it was literally the following weekend I taught a a class a our pistol um, de- defensive pistol level one class and I didn't I didn't take the the rule for I didn't say it like you guys did because you guys went really in depth but what I did do for my demonstration and it was. I took a bit of it away from this class was when I was explaining rule four, I grabbed my blue gun and I had my assistant go stand behind another guy and explain the fact that, okay, that I really need to know what is behind my target and not just what my target is. And I, I showed them how I needed to lean in to take the shot at that guy. So I wasn't, wasn't possibly shooting through him and getting the guy behind him. Yeah. But I I think it was definitely influenced by what you guys taught there. It it was kind of like amalgamating your guys explanation and, and focusing on rule four, but then kind of melding that with how we did the shooting drills. And I, I believe that it was pretty vivid to the students. So, um, I, I, I appreciate you guys. I, 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 I'm pretty sure I might even said, Hey, I, I, I'm going to take something away from a class I took a couple weeks ago, but yeah, that, that class was, was excellent. And, and just, just so we can insert this in here, are you guys teaching that anytime soon, Chuck? Do you know? So weirdly enough, we first did that one in, uh, uh, Wisconsin, so my buddy uh, Robin had set us up for that class and uh, up near Holman, Wisconsin. And we did this and we thought, we talked about it. We set up, hey, this is going to be really cool. We'll do this thing. And we figured going to be a one-off class, right? And then some other people heard about it. Hey, can we do that? Hey, can we do that? So we've had, I think, five sessions of that class now that we've done and it's turned into kind of an on-demand thing. Uh, We don't have one currently scheduled, but Cecil, uh, I text message with Cecil and Daryl just a couple of days ago. Cecil's got a guy up in Montana that wants to host it and we got a couple other bites. So, um, you know, the last, the last time we did it was Texas. And then a couple of months before that we were uh, near, uh, uh, Escondido, California. Mm-hmm. We have been, uh, the, the last one was Dallas, just south of Dallas, but we've been Escondido. Yeah, that's the one I went to. Mm-hmm. We've been to uh, Wisconsin twice. We've been to uh, the excellent Mead Hall Range outside of uh, Shawnee, Oklahoma. Yep. Uh, a couple other places. Um, so uh, it's cool that instead of being a one off thing, people have an interest in in that, I believe, because um, I'm not a big competition versus street, you know, and that some some people talk a bunch of crap about uh, 
you know, competition's going to get killed in the street and things, you know, just worse to that effect. But, um, the, the, that is, as you well know, is very street oriented versus, uh, if you, if you do some of the things you want to do on the street will slow you down and cost you points of competition. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just, it's just a fact. Um, so it's, it's, does my heart good to see people interested in that class? Well, and Chuck, what I will say, and man, I am very disappointed that I wasn't able to make it there for that class. You know, it's just Aaron and I, there's many times where we can't make it to the same class. We try, but, um, of course I met you at TACCON, you know, it was excellent to meet and speak with you there. But what I was going to say on the lines that you were just talking about, and, you know, it's hard, you know, I want to look at it from a lens outside of, of the circles that we're in, because anybody in the range master circle or in within the, the path that we're all in, there, there's a lot of relation. There's a lot of relationships. And, you know, a good example is um, I had just attended the inaugural um, combative summit down in Florida, unbelievable event. It felt like the, com- excuse me, it felt like the tack con of combatives. It was, it was awesome. Yeah, I really wanted happened- to, uh, I really wanted to make that one and I was already booked for something else that weekend. Well, hopefully, hopefully we can see you there, um, this, this next year. Cause it's, it's already being planned. Um, but I, I think I'm trying to combine those two events, like with TACCON, your guys' training, what I am seeing is there is a steady movement towards more people wanting to be in the the coursework and training venues that are most important. And yeah, maybe it's only a small percentage, but like you were mentioning, Chuck, I am seeing a lot more people want classes like your guys' course. So, yeah, I just wanted to make that point. I mean, I love seeing, you know, even, you know, what is it, 10 to 10,000 or so, maybe a little more, seem to be the average numbers that Thomas talked about that really train. And I've always said, man, what would happen if we could simply double that? You know, it, it, so that would be profound in and of itself. But I think, we're going to start to see that. I really do. Your thoughts on that? It's, uh, you know, and the interdisciplinary thing is is uh, actually relatively new, especially for more mass consumption. Uh, a lot of people look at, a, like, Craig Douglas, <laughs> you know, he talks about how successful his ECQC, let's say, is. And uh, people are like, Oh man, he's like, yeah, it, it, he was uh, 20 years of grind to become an overnight success, you know? Yep. Uh, but it, it does my heart good. So I'm friends with guys like, uh, Craig, uh, Paul Sharp, you know, he's yeah. a master of the, uh, interdisciplinary stuff. Yeah. Um, the, the, the entire, uh, Shivworks crew, uh, Shivworks collective, uh, Cecil is, is part of that as well. Um, and there's other people involved in that. Uh, and then, you know, myself, like on the, on the periphery of that, I've got a wrestling background, jujitsu background. Um, I, I, I joke about being mixed martial arts because I ran around like an ADD kid doing Muay Thai and, you know, uh, a screamer and things like that. Uh, cause you know, I was looking, looking for the big secret, and uh, that that is what we have known since uh, the popularization of things like UFC. Uh, look at the body of work that Craig's done with uh, ECQC and, uh, you know, like Paul Sharp's work and things like that, that uh, being able to strike, being able to do some sort of grappling and then integrating your uh, weapons into that reality is pretty much where the answer is. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent thought on that. Well, Aaron, what you got else, man? Well, I just had one kind of fun question because, you know, Chuck, I, I know that you, you favor, it was, you, we, you were either carrying your 19 or your 45. I can't remember, but 
I know that's probably your primary when you're out, but if you're trying to go streamlined, um, kind of like in this class MPE, if you're really trying to keep it low profile, what do you like to carry? Uh, so I, I've got a number of guns that I can start shrinking. Um, uh, I'm very, I'm become very fond of my little Glock 43 X. Uh, I've got a Glock 43, got that Glock 42 we talked about. Um, and I, I have a fascination with small guns. I have in my life carried things like a baby Browning. Um, because, you know, before we had some of the micro guns we have now, um, our choices were kind of limited. Uh, and then what you could get was something very small caliber, like 25s, 32s, things like that. But I have, I have been a strong proponent of the, uh, snub nose 38 revolver for a very long time, mm-hmm. kind of like the package of a Glock 19, you know, you got 16 rounds in, in a, a package that it's big enough to be used as a service pistol and to endure like abuse and mud and things like that small enough to conceal on your person and really conceal well, uh, controllability, uh, easy to repair, easy to run, things like that. There's a reason why Glock 19s are so popular. Um, even amongst like, you know, special operators, yeah, like mm-hmm. the <laughs> Glock 19s have been in the SOCOM system for a very yep. long time. Uh, and then also if you look at truly NPEs, most people don't know that CIA operators overseas uh, and a number of other uh, what my dad <laughs> used to call spooks in Vietnam, uh, the the people that are doing truly undercover stuff. If you read Ed Lovett's book, the the snubby book, uh, Ed Lovett's background is what he's an over thirty year CIA guy. So what happens to you in a foreign country if you get caught rolling dirty? That's pretty significant. You know, you might end up in the basement and, you know, it's going to look like something out of a horror movie, uh, drip, water dripping out of the ceiling. You got maybe a light bulb in the corner, corner. Uh, nobody knows where you're at, that type of thing. So anyway, 38 snub nose revolvers, uh, some sort of J frame, uh, because I mean, like Ruger LCRs and things didn't exist back then, but, uh, some sort of J frame revolver was what those guys carried truly covert carry. And what does that give you? Uh, a very concealable handgun of enough power to deck a grown man that you can hit. Uh, I, I routinely, I still carry a five shot snub as a backup gun when I'm in uniform as a cop. Uh, and every day I've been in uniform since the eighties, I have had a, uh, a backup gun on me. So I have gone back, I, I've dabbled with other things, but keep going back to snub nose 38s, uh, powerful enough to deck a, a large man. Uh, I can hit with it reliably 25 yards and past, um, super reliable, not ammo dependent. You know, any ammo that fits in the chamber is going to run the gun. Um, even if you got less than optimal ammo, uh, that it's still gonna, it's still gonna, you know, run the gun and in a close quarter environment, you don't have to worry about clothing interference, having Mm -hmm. a stovepipe. You can't limp wrist a revolver the way you can a semi-auto, things like that. So, uh, not only Ed Lovett, but other guys that I know that have done, uh, undercover work overseas where they may have to worry about, you know, (laughs) <laughs> the proverbial panel van with guys in ski masks pulling up and dragging you into the van and they're trying to, you know, get the flex cuffs on and things like that. So imagine fighting three or four dudes in the back of a van. What kind of gun do you want to count on that's going to work? Uh, and snub revolvers, what a lot of professionals have done for a very long time. Uh, and then, you know, like I say, the package of concealability, uh, shootability, power on target, and then reliability and worst case scenario, uh, uh, sen- worst case scenario situations really pays off. You know, illustrate that you can pull up the uh, the incident on the internet. Good buddy of mine, Nick, is a, a copper in Metro Indiana, uh, Indianapolis. He just had a gun grab where his holster broke, uh, and bad guy torched off around. Uh, he was he caught about half, my buddy caught about half an HTST in the leg. 
and uh, defaulted to his backup gun, put four rounds of a 38 gold dot into the bad guy, um, saved his own life. Uh, bad guy is no longer with us and the good guy is. Um, and that was in a grapple on the ground, flat on his back, uh, having to shoot at an upward angle at a dude that was much bigger and much stronger than him. Ooh, so, wow, Chuck. Uh, so, so this was just recently. I'm surprised that, that I hadn't heard of that. Yeah, um, that's, uh, the Indy, uh, Indy uh, Metro PD did one of those, you know how they'll do like the briefing, like LAPD's mm-hmm. taking a do in that and, and other, like I just saw one out of Scottsdale. They're like, okay, this is what we had happen. And this is the body cam and this is the circumstances, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Uh, Indy released Nick's incident. Um, you need to look it up on the internet, but that we'll, was, a, we'll do. that was a 642 weekend only. And, uh, you know, like I say, his, uh, his holster broke, uh, gun went off. Bad guy was much bigger on drugs, much stronger than him. And, uh, Nick had to save his own life. And thankfully he had, mindset and training and a good snub nose 38 that uh he he fired four rounds got four hits uh no you know in in situations like that what i have noticed out of because i i have an extensive background of uh among other things in uh investigating officer involved incidents right and what we see in real life is that semi-auto pistols in fights are not as reliable as they are on the range they're just not. So things like a jacked up grip, having a stove pipe, maybe your gun's a little bit dirty, whatever the case may be, clothing interference, um, bad guys trying to grab your gun, uh, semi-autos uh, choke on us much more commonly on the street than they do on the range. Very well said, Chuck. And, you know, you always bring a lot of wisdom and bring excellent connections to you know what we really should be considering and what our audience should be considering for you know self-defense choices i did have one more question now if it's your choice what ammo would you put in that 38 you beat me aaron (laughs) (laughs) so uh i have like carpal tunnel and old guy issues and things like that um uh, what I, what I have found is, you know, you can get away with a lot of recoil for a long time. Like I started in the 357 Magnum days and my Ruger would stand up to full house Magnum. So I fired thousands of rounds of full house 357 Magnum probably didn't do me much good in the long run. You know, um, it's like anything we do ruck runs or jumping out of airplanes or whatever yep. you're going to, you're going to pay it to me. Um, and, uh, so for air weight guns, um, I'm a big fan of, for the most part, uh, a good wad cutter load. Um, I like I like the Remington, the Federal, the Winchester. Georgia Arms has a specific defensive wad cutter made. Uh, I would tell people to buy it, but Georgia Arms had a, a, a unfortunate fire at their factory that they're recovering from. They're hoping to be back uh, making ammo in January, but right now they're kind of uh, in recovery mode. Um, but the Georgia Arms wad cutter, we we tested that at Gunsight at Revolver Roundup, um, uh, myself and Mark Fricky, and that Georgia Arms load is pretty legit. Uh, the the truth of small handguns, and this is something that I talk about. I have a specialty small guns class: uh, pocket rockets, small semi-autos, and uh, snub revolvers. One of the things I point out is if you start sawing the barrel off, it's like a runway on an aircraft. If you get the runway too short, what happens? You don't achieve enough speed. So there's in small nines, 380s, whatever your caliber, if you get the barrel too short, some of your ammo choices are not going to work. Your jacket at hollow points are very velocity dependent. So the dirty little secret of snub revolvers is, is that jacket at hollow points tend not to mushroom. And then like in other guns, like 380s and several other calibers I can point to, if they do mushroom, then they tend to stop short, like they don't penetrate enough. So ammo selection, um, like a wad cutter, a lot of people think it's, you know, I'm sort sort of Luddite that why would I not want a jacket of hollow point or a wad cutter does wad cutter stuff and a jacket of hollow point that doesn't open up actually does less tissue damage. So, uh, wad cutters are, 
one of my go-tos for really airweight revolvers. Now, if I'm uh, carrying like a steel frame gun, 640, the 357 Magnum LCR, uh, K frame, Smith & Wesson K frame, something like that. That 135 grain plus P gold dot is superb. The 158 grain lead semi wide cutter hollow point that Remington makes, particularly the new version, because we just tested that at, at Revolver Roundup in November. The Remington, after uh, the uh, bankruptcy and the reopening, their mm-hmm. ammo is legit. Uh, for a while there, before the bankruptcy and the company that owned them, the umbrella company that owned them, quality control wasn't wasn't where it should be. But now uh, the people from Federal opened up the Remington factory again, and uh, the quality control is a focus. And the new Remington ammo is very, very good. And that uh, classic lead semi wide cutter hollow point, the FBI load, or depending on where you're from, Chicago load, St. Louis load, uh, is pretty legit as Remington puts it out. Um, but quite frankly, there's a lot of dudes out there like Pat Rogers uh, was helping him with a class, with a pistol class up in Iowa. And we were talking about ammo and guns and things like that. And one of the young guys talked about how NYPD, you know, the 38 sucks and things like that. And Pat never had hollow points in his career. He went from round nose to lead semi log cutter. And then in the nine millimeters, they hit full metal jacket, which is just silly, but it's New York. <laughs> But he talked about that uh, that thirty eight the the thirty eight lead load that they carried. He said, "You know what? It worked pretty good if you could shoot." And the secret of handguns is is none of it really works that good if you can't shoot. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, I know people poo poo it, but some as uh, an authority uh, such as Charles Askins, if you read his book, uh, No Second Place Winner. He called the 38 service load, the the classic 158 grain load of back in the day. Um, He called it a, quote, hairy chested man killer. (laughs) And uh, Charles Askins had been involved in enough incidents. He would have a point of reference. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, it is interesting. And and I don't want to spend a lot of time on the on the, you know, the trite caliber debates but what you're you're giving out there is is a little deeper because you know the novices only talk about nine millimeter versus 45 you know you're really a novice if that's all they talk about (laughs) they're really a novice right and it just gets old we roll our eyes but then so and then you have someone like daryl that daryl bulky that that recommends carrying a 22 if that's what you all that you can carry with federal punch, but, and then like you carry and like I carry the, um, Glock 42 and 380. Now what 380 do you like? I didn't mean to go off on this, but just while we're on the topic. So my most recent test was at federal Hydroshock deep that that's yep. a pretty good load, but I'm not opposed to uh 380 with full metal jacket. Mm-hmm. If that's, uh, so when I do ammunition selection, and this is whatever caliber, whatever caliber it is, does it go bang? Does it reliably does it reliably function, feed in my gun? You know, whatever you know, if I got a revolver, semi-auto, whatever the case may be, does it function and feed in my gun? That's it's got to go bang for it to do any good. Next, does it accurately hit to my sights? That's that's what I'm worried about next. Does the bullet penetrate enough? to get the job done because there's a lot of bullets. There's a lot of G with like the RIP bullets and the Liberty halo bullets. And there's a lot of garbage, super Uber velocity, lightweight bullets, glazer safety slugs. They're just garbage. Uh, They do not penetrate enough to get the job done reliably. Right. So uh, once I've solved those criteria, I start work. I start worrying about the nuances of bullet expansion, things like that. Now, if you get into service pistols, and by that I mean 940, 45, 357 SIG, et cetera, service, like something a cop or a military guy would wear in a holster, um, all of those have enough horsepower to make jagged and hollow points work very reliably if they're well designed. And we know from the FBI Miami incident, you can have jacket of hollow points that are poorly designed. You get poor performance. Yep. So uh, things like gold dots and HST, uh, critical duty, Hornady, critical, du- critical duty, 
are, are absolutely superb ammunition, superb ammunition. Uh, one of the things I don't get wrapped around the axle about is, um, and I am a fan of good expanding ammo with the service pistol calibers because in a, in a defensive scenario, CONUS, we already talked about the rule four issues, a nine millimeter, like a NATO ball or a 40 caliber full metal jacket flat point will shoot through like three people in a row. So if I clip my dude that's a bad guy and my bullet ends up 200 yards down range and hits a kid or something, whose fault is that? That's mine. So what jacket of hollow points and those calibers really do is a parachute effect. It's like a parachute on a dragster. What does that do? It keeps the dragster from going through the fence and the hay bales and off into the cornfield, right? So, but in smaller calibers, 380s, 32s, like that 22 punch you mentioned, what what is that designed to do? Not expand so that it, it gets optimal levels of penetration for uh, a small caliber. But as far as like just general mindset, uh, one of the rhetorical questions I ask people is, how many of the combatants killed by small arms fire in World War II were hit with a jacket at hollow point? I don't think any, right? Unless Charles Adskin snuck something to Europe, and that's a, he's the kind of guy that might do it, the answer is going to be absolute zero, right? One of the things I never got hung up about is, you know, the idea of people will tell you, well, if you don't have this, you know, if you're carrying that, you're going to get killed in the streets. And I think that's a mindset failure. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was a point in my life where I was wearing a green uniform, and if World War II popped off on the classic Russians coming through the Folda Gap in Germany, I was going to be fighting Russians with an M16A1 loaded with 55 grain ball and a 1911 loaded with 230 grain ball. That, that, that's the way it was, right? Uh, before me, my dad was in that scenario when he was an air crewman, his survival gun, his bail out of the helicopter gun was what? A 38 revolver with a 130 grain full metal jacket. Am I going to give up? Am I going to go into a fetal? Oh, oh no, I've got 55 grain ball in my M16. I better surrender. No, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I got to do. Uh, I would rather, you know, maybe I'd rather have this gun or that gun, but quite frankly, if you issued me, if, if you told me I had to do the job, if I had to go back in time and do the job that I had to do for most of my adult life, if you gave me a 38 revolver, a 357 revolver, which I did carry, um, a nine, a 40, a 45, whatever, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I got to do. The equipment is ancillary, ancillary, you know, <laughs> what did Steinbeck tell us? The final weapon is the brain, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it is. There are cases where, um, you know, at some point you just got to use what you got and, you know, shoot well, be well trained, well prepared, and you're, you're likely going to do just fine. You know, people do get bent around the axle about caliber choices and all that. And, you know, as Aaron was alluding to it, sophomore, but frankly, you're given a lot of great guidance, um, Chuck, with, you know, with your experience. Well, you look at uh, feats of arms, you know, if you, if people have never heard of the dude and it's sad, we forget our history. Uh, are you guys familiar with uh, Sergeant Alvin York? Oh, yeah. So, you know, what he pulled off what Cooper, Colonel Cooper, would call a feat of arms. Uh, he was he was shooting a lot of Germans with his rifle in the World War One trenches. And so much so they decided a squad decided to commit a bayonet charge against him, thinking this dude with a bolt action rifle is going to get one or two of us. But then we're going to take him out because he's such a pain in our ass. And what does Alvin York do? He has seven bad guys running at him with bayonets. He's got a seven shot 1911. Uh, he dumps all of them before they can get to him. Why did he, did he worry about, oh my God, I've got ball ammo or whatever. And the, the truth of the fact is, according to the, the everything, I, all the research that I've done, if you look at the movie, Gary Cooper was carrying a Luger. Um, when, when they did that, the reenactment of that feat. And a lot of people are like, well, you can't do that with a Luger. He actually had a 1911. And the, the thing is, Alvin York was a technical advisor on the movie about himself. 
Um, and memory is a funny thing in, in the battle. Uh, Sergeant York wasn't really, he didn't really remember which pistol he picked mm-hmm. up. Could have been a Luger. Could have, could have, you know, whatever. Uh, but, you know, do we have guys like Jim Cirillo? Did they do a lot of good work with a Model 10 revolver? Mm-hmm. They did, you know. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Well, now that that is kind of a good segue into some law enforcement topics here. So we've we've talked to you a bit about this before, Chuck, but it, it's nice to kind of round this out again to see what you're still observing, if things have changed, things have gotten better. But what I am, of course, referring to is the, you know, the increased politicized control over police officers and law enforcement, how it has affected both um, law enforcement retention, recruitment. And then we also um, have mentioned um, between us talking about some, some training issues, but can you let us know, kind of give us an update on ex- especially the current state of retention and then on into recruitment, how that's going and what you're seeing? So something I saw for my career starting out was when I started out, guys that get involved, it was a career. You're going to do 20 or 30, get your retirement and go. Combination of a couple of things like how retirement systems work and this very state to state and, you know, maybe even city to city, uh, depending on. So this is kind of a rule of thumb versus absolute statement of hard numbers. Right? Uh, but then the other thing I saw was with LEOSA, the uh, HR 218, the officers, Law Enforcement Officer Safety Act. So that allows officers to carry in all 50 states and the U.S. territories under the Law Enforcement Officer Safety Act, as long as you are full-time or bona fide retired. And then uh, you do your qualification at least once a year, uh, got your retired credentials. So for the retired guys, uh, when it became like at my old job, guys were vested um in the, in the system back then at 15 years. So you would get some retirement, not a full retirement, right? But you were vested. And that's about the same time the, uh, the, the LEOSA was a 15 year standard for a retired officer. We had guys starting to pull the pin at 15. I'm done. I'm done. I'm just leaving. So people weren't doing their 20. They weren't doing their 30. Uh, and it's, it's gotten worse. Our retirement system now is you're vested at 10. So, uh, we got guys doing, if they're in there, they hit that burnout stage, something that, uh, Dr. Gil Martin talks about in the uh, book, uh, emotional survival for law enforcement guys in about the nine, 10, 11 year mark, um, really have to, that's where you see the problems like, uh, attitude, um, you know, getting burnout, uh, starting to have, if, if you fall into the pitfall of alcohol problems, things like that, that's where it really starts to hit hard. Uh, because, you know, humans are cyclical and, and their, their level of enthusiasm and things like that wax and uh, waxes and wanes. So sort of seeing guys bail out at 10. Um, when I went to take the test for my department back in uh, the eighties, when I signed up, I, we showed up for the written test and they hosted it at a local university. And it was one of those big auditorium lecture classroom halls. There was 800 people in that room to take the written test. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm, you know, 21 years old, uh, no police experience, that sort of thing. You know, I got some military time, that sort of thing. I'm never going to get hired. Uh, well, they they cut that down to. 20 people for the, the, the hiring class that, that I was involved in. So I got hired. So 800 people took the test for 20 positions, right? That's the level of people we're trying to get on the job. It was even worse for the uh, fire department guys because everybody, you know, nobody likes cops. Everybody loves firefighters. So a lot, a lot more people would sign up. You know, they might have a thousand people sign up for the fire test. We don't see that anymore. And not only we don't see it in the police world, we don't see it in emergency services in general. Now, uh, just random numbers, let's say my old job needed to hire 15 people for the next recruit class. Instead of two or 300, 800 people signing up, they might get 40 or 50. 
the fire department is seeing the same thing that they they're they're having you know serious recruitment issues then they got retention issues uh keeping people maybe they're there for a couple of years and they get disenchanted with how broke the system is and then they're like yeah i'm gonna go i'm gonna go do something else most jurisdictions are suffering this issue now part of this is your local politics and your local politicians now, a lot of people bitch about the cops that they have and i will tell you wherever you are at whatever jurisdiction you are in you get the cops that you vote for. So yeah, people right. will tell me, well, I didn't vote for whatever, the chief of police, right? That's not how that works. So like in my city, you have a mayor and a city council. Who sets the budget for the police department? Who hires the police chief? Who sets the tone of what they would like to see those cops do? That's the mayor and the city council. So uh, if there's a particular crime, I can tell you from firsthand experience, if there's a particular crime problem in your jurisdiction and your elected official, let's say you have a mayor, like a mayoral or system or city manager, you know, cities vary. If that dude calls up the chief of police and says, I want you to handle this, what do you think is going to happen? Probably going to handle it. Yeah, it's the chief, chief police is going to make sure that becomes a priority. So we see the opposite in like, you know, some of the stuff we say, say, I'll, I'll pick on Los Angeles because, you know, they've had those like malls that get looted and, mm -hmm. you know, shoplifting has basically been legalized because they won't respond to it and they won't uh, prosecute for it. Well, your DA is an elected official, your mayor and city council are elected. So they basically told the cops, we don't want you arresting shoplifters anymore. And if you do, we're not going to prosecute them. So what's what's going on with shoplifting through the Just roof, right? Skyrocketing. Car yeah. break-ins. Um, you know, I, I heard of people in San Francisco that they leave, not only do they leave their doors unlocked, but they'll park their car with their windows down because the bums will walk up and knock out your window without even trying the door to see if it's locked or not. So they'll, they'll leave their windows down and their doors unlocked with nothing in the car. Just let the bums rifle through the car because that way maybe you can get away without your windows being broke. You know, that's what some of our cities have devolved to who's the responsible. And a lot of people are like, Oh, it's the, the cops and the crime. So the cops aren't doing their job. The cops are going to do whatever job their mayor and city council tells them to do. That's a fact of life. Uh, another thing I see in the gun world is all the time, uh, like at my old job, when I was running a range master program, when I was range master for, uh, about three years, um, more than most cops in my state, because there's cops in my state that might shoot a 50 round qual once a year. And, uh, you know, all of us are, are more adept shooters at that. I know IDPA, USPSA that, you know, the guys that shoot thousands of rounds a year, maybe you go to gun, you know, you go to a gun class, maybe it's a thousand rounds in a weekend. Right. So my cops were shooting about 400 uh, rounds per cop two eight hour days a year. That's what they gave me. So I tried to have maximum bang for my buck, but 800 rounds a year. I know a lot of shooters that wouldn't think that that was a robust training program. Would you? Not typically. No. So who sets the priority for that? The department does, but who sets the priorities for the department? The elected mm -hmm. officials do. So if you think your cops are poorly trained and they suck, who is ultimately responsible for that happening? The voters. Yep. I, I talk there. to people, mm -hmm. man, I talk to people all the time. Cops can't shoot and blah, 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 and this and that. And I'm like, okay. Uh, so if, if you believe that to be the case, and I'll just, let's say it is, let's say space value that it is, uh, your cops are poorly trained and they can't shoot well and they should do better. I will ask the person make any statements. I go, have you contacted your elected representatives, whatever they are in your jurisdiction, city council, city manager, mayor, whatever you Alderman. got, county commission. And have you emphasized that as a voter, you want this to be a priority? And I get stares and I can hear crickets. People want to bitch about stuff on the internet or, or shit talk each other, but people don't want to take effective 
action, which quite frankly makes you a poor American citizen. Well, and it doesn't take much to call them, you know, just to even call them. It, it, it takes just moments. How many people yeah. are in your IDPA club or USPSA club? Boy, any, any, about any, any given weekend, 30, 40 people. Um, I, I had a, a, do you, do you mean just like locally? I'm, I'm trying to make sure I'm answering your question. Yeah. So just like, uh, like in, like my IDPA club is inside my County, right? So yeah. most of the dudes that show up, there's people that show up outside, but most yeah. of the dudes that show, we might have a hundred people show up for one of the bigger matches, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of them are going to live in my County. Yeah. What do you think would happen if all 30, 40, 50, a hundred people in your club hit up? If there was a wave of people that were voters that said, we want this to be a priority and you're not taking a care of it as an elected official. Do you think that guy might be worried about or gal might be worried about reelection next time? Oh, absolutely. Just that small amount would do, do yeah. wonders. Yep. But does that commonly happen? Nope. No, it doesn't. Yeah. And, and I, th I mean, you know, we can all, be better. You know, I make it, I would say that I absolutely have been calling my local politicians more than I ever did, but I can get better at it. You know, I, I spent a lot of time at the national level for certain, but, um, you know, it, it is just something that is not common anymore. And, and man, if we, we just start preaching that and, and we're going to take your lead, we're going to start preaching that more on this show. Absolutely. Excellent. A lot of your local election, you look at like the the disaster, like we were talking about LA, everybody was worried about Trump versus Tr Biden, Trump versus Biden, right? So on a day-to-day -day basis, how much does Trump or Biden affect your life versus it, if you're a shop owner in Los Angeles and you have a district attorney that's on record that he won't prosecute things, does that have an immediate and daily impact on your life? Absolutely. Way more impact. Yep. Lo lo local politics, you know, it is. And, and I mean, I would say that, you know, it was 20 years ago when I started figuring that out. And I'm like, man, this is, you know, because I'm, I'm going to tell on myself back then 20 years ago, I didn't pay real close attention on a local level. You know, now cool. when, when, you know, when elections coming up, I'm, you know, doing every bit of the research that I can to make sure I know who I'm voting for and getting to know those individuals because it does, it, it, it is huge. And, and, and by the way, let's look at it this way. That drives also national politics too, from the bottom up, you know, that what happens at the local level if you can change what's going on at the local level, you can absolutely change a lot of people's minds on who in the hell they're voting for at the national level. You know, yeah. Uh, the other the other thing about the the local versus, uh, you know, why why is Soros putting so much money into DA's uh, runs on you know DA offices? It's because it has that local effect. Absolutely. So the other the other thing is a defensive gun carrier. Uh, do you think about the jurisdiction where, where am I going to go? And I'm carrying, let's say I get into a defensive shooting. Are you worried about what jurisdiction you're in when that happens? And then the ramifications of what happens next. So if somebody's going to file charges to put you in prison, is that going to be uh, a Senator or a president, or is that going to be a district attorney? DA. That's going to be the County attorney. And and I think that is the point too, Chuck. Is you know George Soros, and now his son is starting to take over because you know George Soros looks like he's about to die. Frankly, uh, that's probably rude of me, but I don't care. Um, but his son is taking over what he's doing, and you know just because George Soros is about to be out of the game, his son is right there behind him. And, and even though those local DAs, you know, have, have, are the focus, it is all around the United States. 
And, you know, I know there's multivariate reasons for why the violent crime and murder are starting to skyrocket, you know, depending on what the statistic um, you look at, you know, I mean, it, it's upwards in the 40s, 40 percentile now. And and it's all contributory t- to that type of political movement, right? Well, if you look at uh, what's driving it, do you think if uh, a bad guy does something and they get away with it, that they think they can get away with it again? Absolutely. So you get some of these large cities like Chicago, their murder clearance rate is down like 20%. So if you think about that, uh, if you're a gang member, four out of the five dudes that you know that did a murder no, they've they've never been arrested for. Do you think that's going to make you bolder? Make you think you can get away with shit? Make you think the the old rules don't matter? Most Absolutely. assuredly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what's unfortunate is is you know I I think we we got some pretty hard times coming, you know, because because it's going to take. It's like stopping a train, you know, and tr- or trying to turn a ship around. It's yep. extremely hard. There is massive momentum with these policies, with these DAs, and with the mindset of people, the mindset of the criminal actor that um, we haven't seen the worst of it. I, you know, I'm not trying to at all be pessimistic. I'm just trying to be a realist is that th- this is set in motion – some serious societal ramifications that folks got to wake up and they've got to start somehow getting these DAs um, thrown out of office, start demanding of all of the local state uh, national politicians demand, you know, and unfortunately it's, it's going to take a long time. Well, and, and when it comes to who you vote for, so in my city, I'm man, I'm just going to lay this crap out. So I live in Tulsa County, but I live in a city called Jinx. Now, I am under Tulsa County, and most everything affects me from Tulsa, but I can't vote for the freaking mayor. And so what happens here, this is one of the most, Chuck, you know Oklahoma pretty well. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty dang conservative place. One of the most conservative states there is. Very, very, very favorable to gun owners. And, you know, you shouldn't have too many issues with DAs coming after you um, if you're involved in a self-defense shooting. But I can tell you this. It's real hard to get elected as a Democrat in the city of Tulsa. So what Mr. G.T. Bynum did was ran as a Republican. He got in there and he's ran that, ran that city hall just like a leftist. When all the COVID stuff, he, he, all the COVID stuff came about, he was gleefully locking everything down he could. And, and I mean, he, you could tell his little, you know, he, he enjoyed doing his, weekly or every few day briefings. Okay. And what this was on national news the other day, he decided he was going to make Tulsa, Oklahoma, a sanctuary city for illegal immigrants. Yeah. So I, I would gleefully vote against that dude, but I can't. What a piece of crap that runs as a Republican, because he knows he can't get elected as a Democrat. Now, that's not unheard of, but he did it, and he's, he was a leftist with an R by his name. He's, that's the way he's ran things. Well, I'll tell you what, I was playing at a basketball game the other day because I play guitar for a college pet band, and that punk right walked right in front of me, man. <laughs> I was like, oh, gosh. Keep your composure here, Aaron. <laughs> but I'm just starting to, I'm saying it is hard. There's that cycle of, okay, you think you're voting someone in, 
It's going to do good. And then they turn around and literally pig in a poke you. Well, even uh, even in the position you're in, I'm sure there's some sort of pack. <clears throat> uh, next time he's up for election, that somebody's going to run against him and that person is going to need uh, election funds or re-election funds or some sort of political, a- political action committee or something like that. Um, that yeah, that's a good, get, get, get involved that way. That's a great, that's a great suggestion. If you look at some of these critical, like, uh, the last, the last national, um, they focused on these swing States, Georgia being one of them, a whole lot of the money for the people that the, uh, people with an ad- agenda were trying to get elected. A yep. whole lot of the money was coming from out of state. Oh yep. yeah. Well, if, if other people can do it, you can do it too. And maybe you don't want to do out of state. Maybe you want to worry about what's happening in your, in your County, but there's going to be some mechanism for you to help or hinder, uh, the people you think should be elected or, uh, you know, not elected. I, I sure would love a voice against that piece of junk. I mean, man, I, I can't stand the sight of him. Okay. That, that, that's enough, bro. So, Eric, I'm going to hand it off to you for some fun topics. We're getting here pretty close to a, to a good long show. Yep, yep. So, so just changing, you know, we have talked a little gear. Um, but, you know, Aaron and I have been back in a kick of long gun stuff again. And, you know, we just wanted to ask you, what's your long gun of choice? So... <clears throat> shot a lot of guns for a lot of my life and uh you know i'm living in living in kansas plain states things like that so my choices might change according to geography right Mm -hmm. like went up to alaska might change but right now my general purpose rifle is a 16 inch ar with a uh variable optic right yeah i know we we love the acronym so we get the, what is it? LPV. LPVO. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> when I started out deer hunting, if you had a scope on your rifle, the popular thing was a three to nine power. Mm-hmm. And we just called those scopes. Yeah. <laughs> so you had a scope or a variable scope. Uh, and we don't, you know, it's a low power variable optic. Okay. Okay. Um, but uh, like one of one of my guns, I got a 16 inch uh, Colt, and it's got a got some Steiner one to four glass on it. Nothing super fancy. So I have taken nine deer, probably close to 20 coyotes with that gun. So that has become my woods walking, deer hunting, predator control, general purpose gun, and I have carried it as a patrol rifle in, in a cop car. Nice. Uh, so what ammo are you, um, when you're, um, di- when you're using it for deer, I'm just curious what ammo you're using. I'm a big, I'm a big fan, uh, for a while now of 62 grain gold dot. Oh yeah. Yeah. So which I'm, ass- which I'm assuming is the federal bonded 62, um, yeah, grain uh, bullet that federal has, I think. Yeah. It's the, it's the gold dot line bullet, but it's the exact same bullet is also the federal fusion. Yep. Yep. Started I've got some of those. Yeah. Started out as a 64 grain. They changed it to 62 grain. It's it's exactly the same. I've shot it in ballistic gelatin. I've shot it from 10 and a half inch guns, 16 inch guns, 20 inch guns. Uh, it's a really accurate bullet. I have taken, we have big deer here in Kansas. I commonly shoot does uh, in doe season for meat that are over 200 pounds. And those that are over 200 man that is those huge. those that are over 200 pounds common, wow right so big big deer where you need some penetrations and bullet performance and then uh i've shot uh when i was at the airport gig uh every once in a while we had to do uh, animal control because you can't have yeah so you can't have animals on the runway because that makes your jets wreck right <laughs> um, so we would have to do, uh, the coyotes would get under the fence and run around inside the airport. And I've, I've had to whack coyotes 300 yards away cause they don't want to let you get close and the bullet still performs. So it'll open up on a light body animal at distance. 
it'll penetrate a large deer at very close range. It does well against auto glass. I've shot up cars with it. I've shot it against uh, soft body armor. I've shot it in ballistic gel from guns as short as 10 and a half. Uh, it's just a superb general purpose load. Nice. Cool. Nice. Very, very yeah, cool. I've got quite a few of those in the safe and it's, it's in my rifle that has a scope on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of aim points and I'm a big fan of quality glass. I've got Steiner. I've got, um, I got some Vortex. Uh, I've actually got a, one of, one of my scopes uh, I've been playing around with is a Bushnell. One of the things I really like about the Bushnell is, uh, the lens coating they put on it. Some pro- proprietary, they got a name. I'd have to go look it up. But one of the things I noticed, like it, it gets, we get a real winner here as well. Uh, you ever accidentally breathed on your scope? Had had your breath hit your scope when it's sub freezing and it, you get it all, you know, it's all fogged oh, up. Yeah. Maybe it turns into, you know, if it's cold, it turns into ice. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. That coating on that Bushnell lens, it it'll fog up and then it'll just kind of fade away. So uh, I'm playing around with that scope. It's pretty good scope so thus far. Uh, I can't attest to long term durability, but there's a lot of people making good. One to four, one to six, one to eight uh, uh, variable optics. That, you know, um, I've made very long shots on a four power scope. Uh, you know, my time, like I'm, I'm a school trained sniper through through the army system. Um, I, I started in a day when things were less sophisticated. You know, my first sniper sniper rifle had a wood stock, and we had to do the Acura glass bedding on and that sort of thing. Um, so what we have now with the plug and play guns and the quality of the optics is superb. The, the quality of some of the guns that are coming out and the ammo, man, it's, it's plug and play. I don't think people nowadays that get into this realize how good they have it. When we used to have to do like, you know, sacrifice a chicken and wave it over the gun to get it to shoot straight and, you know, <laughs> use, use, yeah, you know, glass bed the action and hand load the, the ammo and things like that. But yeah, my general my general purpose is uh, Colt Bravo Company, um, the Liberty Gun Works, or you know any other quality AR like that. Um, and I'm a, I'm still a big fan of the 16 inch guns because of how much velocity. You know, you can stretch with the right ammo. You can stretch those guns out to 600 yards yeah. without a, a you, you know talking combat, not hunting, but you can stretch them out there quite a bit. And they're very useful as a general purpose gun, predator control, self-defense, police patrol, deer hunting, yada, yada, yada. So, yeah. That's a, that's a fun conversation. Now in that instance, so Eric, I'm still in your question. Mm -hmm. Go for it, man. So then the next question, Chuck, is if you have your choice, and you need to wake up to some people kicking in the door. What are you grabbing if you have time? Is it still that AR? It might be an AR, might be a shotgun. So <laughs> I've seen I've seen the aftermath. I've seen a lot of people shot. Seen the aftermath of a lot of people shot. Um, and even though I'm in a, in a pretty good area as far as like uh, RDA and things like that. Um, it's not lost on me that virtually every shotgun event I've seen, like defensive shotgun, double up buck, things like that, has been a one round event. Mm-hmm. So, if also I think uh, so. Uh, truthfully, uh, in my in my previous life, when I was a baby cop, I had my duty pistol, I had my duty revolver, my backup gun, I had an AR fifteen, and I had a shotgun. So. Uh, for my house gun, I would grab the shotgun first. And people talk about, well, it doesn't have the capacity and to have this, doesn't have, have that, but it's probably going to be a one round event. And then what's going to happen to that gun? Gonna it, get it, it's going to get going into evidence. evidence. And it might be into evidence a while. Uh, so is it easier for me to replace a shotgun or, or a high end AR? Uh, if if they're going to take one of my guns away and I have what I have until I can replace that gun, 
then what else do I have? So, you know, it used to be my shotgun was my definite go-to because uh, I got a lot of got a lot of shotgun time. Um, and when I started in police work, we had revolvers and pump shotguns. So I decided I better get good with what I have because I could bemoan, well, I'd be better off if I had this. Doesn't matter. I don't have it. So, you know, the world is the way that it is. We have to conform to reality. So I got really good with a pump shotgun and really good with a revolver. Um, and I am not uncomfortable with any of the above. And then I ask other people, uh, let's say you do live in Montana or Alaska or whatever, right? What breaks in your door may not be a person. Yep. Because oh yeah. Bears in some jurisdictions have taken to, uh, knocking doors in to, cause they want your groceries or whatever. So, oh, yeah. uh, you know, where right now, probably whatever's close. And then quite frankly, if it's the proverbial bump in the night, am I probably going to pick up a, like right now I've got a Glock 17 with an Acro and a, uh, Surefire U-boat, you know, thousand lumen pistol light on it. Am I going to pick up my pistol and my mod light and go, uh, check out what that noise was, you know, probably it's probably going to be a handgun is what I grab. Um, if I know the door just crashed in, probably going to be a long gun, but, um, you know, if it's the proverbial wake up to the bump in the night and you're not sure, man, was that something? Was that not something? I don't know. Is there somebody outside my house? Do I have a prowler or whatever? Um, I'm going to go check it out. That it's probably going to, it's going to be a handgun and a handheld light. Nice. Nice. Well, so Chuck, I think we've taken enough of your time, but we got one last question for you. Sure. So have you asked Santa for anything for Christmas and what might it be? (laughs) (laughs) My, my, uh, my list of stuff I would like to have is rather long. Um, (laughs) Same here. (laughs) Same here. Uh, like right now I have, I like, I am, I like lever guns quite a bit and I've been through a bunch of them in my life, but I don't currently own a, a lever action rifle. I'm sad to say. And if you've never shot something like a 357 Magnum lever action, um, you know, I might, I might pick up a Rossi, uh, or Taurus, I forget, you know, they're kind of the same company, but the, uh, the lever guns coming out of, uh, coming out of Taurus Rossi. Uh, are very good now. I've shot shot their new thirty thirty. The Henrys, very very nice. Uh, I have a hankering to pick up a pistol caliber carbine, like a nine millimeter AR, and shoot some of the the run and gun courses, you know, USPSA or something like that, just because it's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I I like old revolvers, so when I'm in a gun shop or a gun show, I'll keep my eye open for you know something like a model 28 Smith and Wesson is always going to be cool. And, uh, that kind of thing. I've been playing around with several other guns. Um, you know, one of the, one of the experiments that I've done is budget guns. Uh, like I've owned or shot, uh, extensively seven different Smith and Wesson SD nines. And I think it's a glor- poor man's Glock 19. It's a really good, like, security guard dude has to buy his own gun. It's a really good mm-hmm. gun. Uh, I tried different revolvers. I have a Smith & Wesson Sport. Uh, back when those were a $490 AR-15, that was my p- poor man's patrol rifle. I was trying that out. So there's several other guns out there, like the uh, Taurus G and the uh, GX4 series that I've shot thus far have been really good guns. So I'm tempted to pick up one of those and uh, really wear it out and see, uh, see what happens. Um, Cause I'm always experimenting with that kind of thing. But I think the next thing I'm going to pick up is either going to be 387 or 3030 lever gun just because. Cool. Cool. Very cool. Well, yeah, we, we asked ahead, that Aaron. question just in case your wife, I mean, Santa hears this back. <laughs> So j- just looking out for you, buddy. We'll, we'll check those <laughs> great, great answers and, and a lot of fun. You know, we always say this. We, we like gear. We talk gear sometimes, but we also know the reality of the most important things to talk about are 
are typically not gear, but we like to every now and then. But so, well, Chuck, thank you for your patience this evening, you know, getting this thing together. I mean, this has been an awesome conversation. We're going to go ahead and try to let you go. But, you know, this show is um, a Christmas show because this will air right at Christmas. So we'll go ahead and say Merry Christmas to you and yours and uh, let you have a good evening. Merry Christmas to you guys and anybody listening. Yeah, th- there will be millions listening to this this weekend. So, <laughs> yeah. Good call. Merry Christmas to all our audience out there. We appreciate your guys' support, guys and gals. Yes, Merry so. Christmas. Talk to you guys Merry soon. Christmas. Bye-bye.